So thank you very much to Dr. Watson Thompson and Dr. Kennedy for really stimulating presentations. I agree, we've definitely reached saturation of themes. Um, I am going to quickly summarize a little bit. Um, although I'd love to just restate everything because it's so amazing what's been said here today. When I finish summarizing, I'm going to ask that people who have questions to just gather over to the, that side of the room where the microphone is, if it's still there. Um, and um, please, fire away. Let's have some good dialogue, uh, and a facilitated dialogue. Excuse me. Um, so uh, just to bring back to what uh, Dr. Pastor um, so well articulated this morning about sharing power to harness more power, and that it's from the power that we can change or make policy. Um, and that really speaks to the power of the we. And both of you, both um, in your presentations, demonstrated the power of the we. Um, and that really is what should propel us forward to, to continue this work and, and scale it. Um, because it really is an authentic part of the change process. And that this involves long-term commitment, uh, mutually, mutuality, um, mutually shared visions and dreams, uh, like the immensity of the sea, the endless immensity of the sea. Um, it has to be reinforcing and ongoing. And really about um, building the new narrative through facilitated dialogue, which is what we just heard, um, and that being a vehicle for change. And that involves breaking down our silos and really getting moving from single stories um, and how we, we view things. And, and sometimes we are just seeing the surface and not the 3D, as was mentioned earlier before, of a person and their story. And to bubble up those concealed stories that was so well articulated earlier this morning and highlight our similarities and our shared vision and understanding that we do this best through rethinking how our ecosystems can really converge and amplify and champion this work through understanding that both the community side and the academic side have resources and assets to each other. So with that, I'm going to open this up to questions. I don't see any more. Jamal and Renee, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Renee, thank you for pointing out all the uh, uh, issues that we bureaucrats in public health have. And, it helps to hear them out loud to make us uh, deal with them. Uh, I wondered if you could elaborate on a couple things. One is how, uh, if you can provide a little more information about how you're able to reach out and connect with uh, your community organizers. I think that's an important piece for me. And uh, if you can also talk a bit uh, about the extent to which the hospitals were engaged in your process and how. Thank you. Well, our community organizing uh, entity is Action of Greater Lansing. And when I first became the health officer a couple of years ago, I didn't realize, I thought she was just coming by to say hi and to get to know me. She was actually doing a one-on-one -on, -one on me and finding out what my self-interests were. So she was trying to kind of bring some life to this pretty small um, entity and having then learned what one-on-ones were, we could reach out to her and say, here, well, what can we do to help position you for success? What do you need from us? And so then we began that relationship, and it's really just been, uh, you know, a couple of years now. So that's very exciting. The hospitals, um, it's, that's just been an amazing dynamic, um, bringing a, a business-driven market share competitively aligned um, field to say, can we just lay that stuff aside and sit and talk for a while? It took a ton of work, um, but building a culture and reframing rethinking requires a lot. We just happened, um, my friends in the development, in the fund development world tell me, well, people don't always give to causes. Sometimes people give to people. And so we kind of would sit around a room and strategize across relationships and do kind of a, a relationship matrix and say, well, who knows that person? Oh, oh I, you know what? I know them. Their kid plays soccer with my neighbor. And so I see. So we would try to build trust and relationship and dynamic across relationships that then could translate into the work being more effective. Hello. 
This is oddly positioned. Hold on. So thank you both very much. Um, and my question is for Dr. Renee Kennedy. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for your work and what you've been able to build. Um, and I love that you said you want the, your assets to be the community's resource. And, and, and you, you mentioned this too in previous um, versions of what was called community engagement. Public health would go into communities and they'd say, we're going to get input, but there was no line of accountability um, for that input to ever go anywhere or change anything or, or do anything. So people felt often quite used. So I love where you're moving, and I wanted to know if you could speak more to how do we build in more public accountability for that back and forth and shared collective responsibility of public health in the community? Boy, accountability, it's big, big, big scarlet letter. Um, I, it's very um, challenging, Kate, honestly. Um, and oftentimes when, when, when funders require us to institutionalize interventions and they don't want it to be person dependent, as a sociologist, I haven't figured out how to make things not person dependent. I am really nervous <laughs> right now about my, the department I left. Um, and I can't really tell the new health officer to act like me and value what I, <laughs> what I valued um, because she'll bring new strengths and different priorities. Uh, but I can continue to, talk, to tell the stories. And I think storytelling, which is another strategy that our community organizing partners have taught us, the more you tell the story, the more the affect gets engaged. As public health professionals, we're scientists and purists. And if we don't invite values and feelings to the table, the drive and the passion will go away. And so I think the accountability comes out of that passion, that commitment, that solidarity across controversy. Um, and so that's what we have done in our community. And sometimes it happens collectively in a group, and other times it happens at lunch when you just say to a colleague, I haven't seen you in a long time, let's go eat. What's happening in your world? Let's break bread. How can I support you um, when we are sort of other centric in our initiatives? It ends up benefiting us. Um, I have two strains of uh, question. I'm not sure I, um, I have it qu quite clear. But it, and Renee, something you said uh, jogged my head is you were talking about in some, sometimes you have community organizing capacity, sometimes you have public health capacity. and. Um, and, and that's really true in New York. We have some uh, counties and some cities that have great public health departments, and there are some places where there's some really good dynamic community organizing and community-based organizations. And, uh, but, it, but today I thought I heard a lot about the community organizing forces. It was truly last night. They were sort of doing battles. You know, there seemed to be an issue they cared about, and they were trying to solve that issue. And last night, it was amazing how simple it was. Like when we asked them, "What are your goals in population health?" It was getting rid of those cheese sandwiches, which is, uh, you know, so you're starting pretty small. And my sense is that, um, so that's one concern: is is do we have to get those two? forces to work together, the public health, which I guess I think of as government public health, that's you, and, um, uh, and then these community organizing. I didn't hear Manuel once mention a public health department uh, in, in Los Angeles. And until this panel, I didn't hear anybody, I don't think, today mention public health departments. So that, that's concern. So that's one strain. And then the other strain is I, I still sort of feel like if it, a lot of us have this aspiration, surely places like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation does that, they want to create this culture of health. They really want to transform the way we organize our communities to promote health and, and to do that. And in my head, that involves, that's like a war. It's not a battle. That's a war. We need food in, in low-income neighborhoods. We need city bikes in every place. We need you know, bike lanes. We, you know, you, it goes on and on. And a lot of that sounds like you need government to do and all. So I guess I, I, I'm struggling with um, how do we take this to scale, or is it an evolution process, or, or how do we unite forces to be able to to do a war instead of some important battles. And I'm not belittling battles, but I just, I, I think, I'm well, not sure if that's a clear you know, question. We, so. um, we didn't get here overnight, but somehow or another, we want to get away from here overnight. 
like quick. Like, um, assistant professor, we're going to review you for tenure in three years, and are you going to have massive changes? You know, we can't give ourselves permission to, to really understand the impact of long-term change. Now, I'm not an incrementalist, per se. I, I like to see some change happen kind of quickly. Um, but we also have to recognize that the process, if it's done correctly, is leading us towards something. We can all continue to do parallel play in the sandbox for the psychologists in the room. But we also, and there'll be some benefit to that, but there will be greater benefit around collective effort, I believe. Um, I think we got some things done. I mean, if, even if you look at our H1N1 efforts as local health departments, there's no way in the world I could have put forth an effective intervention without tons of community help. And that's what we did. So it's sort of the lessons from that is that we have to come together as agencies and as institutions, recognizing that we do have our own agenda. But what the lesson we've learned from community organizers, or at least that I've learned, is that everybody does have a self-interest. Now, I used to say, I don't have a self-interest. I really prefer others. I mean, I'm going to do the work because it benefits others. I don't have a self-interest. And my community organizing colleague said, that's a self-interest. <laughs> You want to do the work in a way that benefits others. So now I know something about you. So how do we um, just recognize that it's going to take, hold ourselves accountable, what, what's different today um, that wasn't there a year ago or even six months ago or even three years ago. Uh, for us, the power of we is our, our community's accountability structure. Hello again. Um, thank you both for your presentations. Um, again, the saturation, yes, but still interesting and inspiring and um, stimulating to the mind and just reinforcing um, the conversations, dialogues that we're having, hopefully no debates, I think. Um, so I wanted to um, add on something and also ask your perspective on this. When we talk about collaboration and we talk about collective impact and partnerships, Something that we're really trying to move towards as well is the business community so that it's not it, the nonprofit and the for-profit are together and government and education. And, you know, we've noticed there's definitely some challenges that get in the way. Um, for example, I think Joe alluded a little bit earlier about how, you know, we've gone in and they think we're the health department. They're like, oh, you cannot come in here, you know. <laughs> um, and they're scared of us, yeah. Well, they think they're going to get written up or, uh, you know, the, um, so we got rid of the clipboards, you know, which we thought made us look official. So um, anyhow, o over time, after we developed the relationship with them, um, first of all, we've learned to incentivize the youth with stipends, right? But that's also what we do with the market owners and the, and the restaurant owners. So really, everybody's on the same playing field that way, but it's really about the shared commitment um, and the goal. Um, but I, I really think, and I just wonder what you guys think and everybody else really, is to me it seems like making changes would really involve the profit and nonprofit, you know, and other institutions. And how can we engage the for-profit community um, in a way that's meaningful? So last little story is Martine, the owner of the last market that we worked with, once we started connecting with him, he started sharing about his own health issues, his family's health issues. He was inspired to make the changes that we had worked with him on and then started making a bunch on his own. Um, and so then it really becomes his. And then he's making more money now and selling more healthy food um, and promoting healthy eating for, for you know, our partnership but also for his work. So my question is really about profit, nonprofit, partnerships in all of that context. <laughs> Thank you. You know, um, I've been thinking a lot about policy, um, and we do tend to be very um, sort of egocentric, and we think about public policy. Private sector policy is critically important. I'm really sorry that a member of your roundtable, Dr. Sepulveda, right, Martin, he represents that interest so well, and he's bilingual, multicultural in terms of he can speak governmental and he can speak uh, business sector. Um, you guys are doing some amazing things in California around the social impact bonds, which is what the more liberally bent 
people like to refer to them as, or um, sort of the other model is, um, you know, kind of pay for performance. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, pay for success, which is what the, the more conservatives prefer. Either way, the outcomes are the same. You know, if we're slicing it this way or slicing it that way, we do have to make ourselves more accountable. We spend too much money on this work to be so um, unhealthy as a nation. So somewhere, all of us, this is not about laying blame. It's identifying gaps and problems and challenges that we will work together on. And so we've just begun thinking about inviting um, the small business um, owners and representatives to the table. But we've got to shift the way we have the conversation because they have come and they're like, huh, what are you talking about? You know, even the personal responsibility conversation. It's a good conversation. We don't, this is multiple voices all, both and. Um, so my argument to personal responsibility advocates are absolutely. So what can we do structurally to make sure that the healthy choice is the easy choice for that person trying to be responsible for their health? It's both and. And that's what we have to do with the business sector. So, um, Sandy Magnan um, from Minnesota. So I'm not sure I really have my question well formulated, but the, the power of we, if I'm really convinced, you know, community organizing, but I'm also in the health care sector. And um, that sector, I mean, you just look at the release of Medicare data yesterday about dollars spent and the immense amount of dollars that we're spending in health care and I think Renee you said if you were talking about health care we're certainly not getting our money's worth out of that. So where is the role of community organizing to help health care deal with the waste that's in health care? What's the role of community organizing because left to our own devices, healthcare has an economic interest to keep that one sixth of the economy going. So, what's the role of community organizing to help us take the waste out of healthcare to free up resources to put into public health, population health, into communities, into health equity? Well, that's a huge question. And since I'm not a community organizer, I'm not going to dare try to respond. But I know community organizers are engaging because uh, we sent several colleagues um, to week-long training, uh, which is a community organizing training. And the direct action that they observed was on a huge health system in the area where the training was. But um, I'll defer to my colleague. And then maybe, Kate, you can say something. I actually think this is where the quality comes in. And I really, I really believe that if the patients and the people in communities, um, again, I don't want to speak for the community organizers. I have done a little bit, but that was pre-being a doctor. Um, if, if, if our patients and the people in the communities push for quality care that's consistent, whether you're, and I'm going to use my example, um, receiving care on the Gold Coast of Chicago at the Mecca Northwestern Prentice Women's Hospital for, you know, we have 13,000 births a year. It's a branded birth. It should be the exact same as a, a federally qualified health center that Northwestern Memorial Healthcare System has now taken over on the west side of Chicago where the infant mortality rate is extremely high and there's high health disparities. If patients can push and people and communities can push for quality and it goes across all of the metrics and that's where equity comes in for moving for public towards population health, I think that is the sweet spot. It's at the quality. So we're trying, just to answer your question, uh, organizing people around cost efficiency of hospitals is not um, the easiest campaigns to draw people in around and get really mad about. But th there's actually a lot of anger to be found and tapped into around that. 
Um, our most successful work has happened in Camden, New Jersey. We've partnered really closely with Dr. Jeff Brenner, and we have an organizing federation there that works to connect organizers with some of the highest emergency room users. And so we've taken that model to five different cities across the country because it's, it's very cost effective. It also provides some people with some significant dignity that they need and deserve. And having an organizer there actually solves some of the problems that these patients are having that, that emergency room doctors cannot solve. So that's one. And then we're also working um, in Ohio with making sure that every hospital is giving the same postnatal care uh, across, across cities. So there's a lot left to do, but we are trying to figure out some really um, innovative ways to address the inefficiencies, which ultimately are about um, people's lives. So that's all I have. <laughs> okay, very last question. <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, I want to thank you both for a magnificent presentation. Uh, very, very, very um, thoughtful and insightful. And I've been sitting on my hands on this one, but I, I, I decided to <laughs> relieve and let the blood flow. Um, and it's really about the academic community partnership. Um, you know, having worked a lot in communities over the years, you know, I hear the communities say, no more data, especially that non-relevant stuff. And then in the academy saying, the data that you want to collect that the community really needs, it's not rigorous, it's not valuable, it's not going to be useful. And I'm trying to figure out if you can give me some insights into how do you balance this because for those people who are in the academy trying to, to make that movement out into communities um, with science that might be very simple like do you have food or don't you? <laughs> to the community saying, yeah, but your rigorous stuff is just like, we can't make sense out of it, it's not useful. And you're studying something that we already know, I can already tell you the answer to it. And you're just describing our problems over and over and in different ways. So I don't know if there's a push or is there a posture that universities need to take? Is there an agenda that communities need to take? to try to find some peace and reconciliation around that relationship. Well, I definitely would uh, agree that it can be a tension um, between what maybe the academic partners feel as if need to be collected um, and then uh, the interpretation of that by the communities. Um, I think probably one aspect of that is beginning the process in the beginning with the project or wh whatever you're doing with identifying what questions need to be examined and what are the different ways to examine it. Um, and so, you know, we may have a perspective and um, types of data that we think might be appropriate, but if the community does not feel it's appropriate, if they not feel it's helpful to what they're needing to understand, then it's, um, it's probably not extremely meaningful. I mean, data are really only as good as it is utilized. Um, and so with that, I think um, having the partners at the table from the beginning to determine what are the different ways that we can collect, that we can measure this information and then how we can feed it back out. So if data is a part of the ongoing, or information is a part of the ongoing conversation and the kind of the culture and the process of what you do, um, then if data are not being used, if it's not being utilized, and I think you need to go back and start the conversation again about what will be most helpful to you. I mean, there are formats in which we sometimes traditionally may present data in and if nobody gets it, but those of us that are presenting it, then that's, that serves no purpose and it, and it has no utility. The other part I would say is kind of the qualitative piece of it. Um, so matching it with this, the storytelling um, as well to go with maybe the quantitative or the other types of data that are being presented. Thinking about the formats in which data are presented, I think um, is pretty hot right now. Um, so whether it's through the infographics or however, um, to communicate it in ways that people can understand. And then doing some validity testing really um, to see if what you're presenting, if it has meaning, utility for those that you're serving, um, it's probably pretty powerful. And the other aspect of it is, is the, it's not always academic 
person in academia going to the community, um, but something we're thinking about is how do you engage the community more in academia? So, you know, bringing them and occasioning the conversations where they're coming and where they're almost training, not, I'm going to say training, but informing us about, <laughs> maybe training, about what matters and what needs to be done. So it's not always going this way, but, you know, something I know with our group that we're talking about quite a bit is inviting the other way so that we're being kind of educated as well about the ways in which data can be or information can be presented and can be dis disseminated that's meaningful. So I think that willingness to be bi-directional with learning and with the uh, information sharing process and that it's not just something that happens at the end of the year or whatever, but that it's part of the culture and that you're informing what's working and what's not working with the data that's being presented is um, how you might can establish a culture of data-informed decision-making that matters both parties or both entities involved. If, if I can just add to, um, Dr. Pasteur also referenced the publisher parish versus public or parish, and I mean, I, the academy is a hierarchical, power-driven uh, bastion, for lack of a better word. And I, when I was an NIH-funded researcher for those three years of my funding cycle, I had such a different voice and access in the academy you would have just thought I went to bed and woke up a completely different person. I would love to see those highly accomplished scholars, many of whom are in the room, really challenge the paradigm. At some point, the academy has to value something else. And, you know, talk, I, they can hear outsiders, and I have this sort of weird one foot in both worlds or whatever, but until those in the academy that are tenured and successful, highly published, highly funded, until they say, stop the train, we need to think differently about what is the value added that we're bringing to this society. Um, I think it won't change, but there are those, there's enough agitation happening, I think, in the academy where people are beginning to challenge and question themselves. And that's precisely why I opened this panel the way I did. I need more people to join me, so I need you all to come through and help me build the pipeline so we can move and move towards this because there are some of us already, we just need to keep telling our stories, who are tenured, who have lots of NIH funding and all those great mes metrics of academia. Um, so please help join me and, and uh, create this revolution. Thank you.